It's a rare human experience to feel fully known. This can get especially complicated for leaders who feel the expectation to show up to their role in certain ways. But what if the version of us that others expect us to be doesn't actually line up with the version of us that feels most true? Today on the podcast, Lisa and I are truly honored that Dr. Jessica Chenfang has joined us to talk through all of this and ultimately what it means to explore the art of building trust with others and in ourselves. Dr. Chen Feng is known in the field of marriage and family therapy for her clinical expertise and scholarship integrating socio-contextual lenses of race, gender, and generation into work with minoritized individuals, families, and communities. She's the co-author of two books, including a brand new one, Asian American Identities, Relationships, and Post-Migration Legacies. Today, Jessica unpacks for us the complex dynamic and integration of personal growth, leadership, and self-discovery. Lisa and I trust you'll enjoy her just as much as we do. Well, hey there. I am so thrilled. Lisa and I are thrilled to have Dr. Jessica Chenfeng join us today. Jessica, welcome. Thank you so much. That's a pleasure to be here with you both. Yeah, I was. Uh, we were sort of talking before we jumped on the air that we've met each other in interesting contexts, in hiring committees here and there. And so while we haven't, we're both at Fuller Seminary, while we haven't taught classes together or spent tons of time together on committees, we feel like we've gotten into deep work fast. So I am just eager for our listeners to hear from you today. Me too. Yeah. And, and I'm excited too, because I feel like in the process of conversation and it, and I, I feel like you and I have experienced this in our times together. So much is generated through conversation. So I'm excited to to be in discourse with you both. Yeah, we're really looking forward to this conversation, um, Jessica. And, uh, you know, you have a fascinating, very accomplished background, both as a an, an, uh, member of the academy, a, a theologian of sorts, uh, and a practicing therapist. Um, as you think about uh, your own way of being in the leadership context, in a leadership setting, what are the things you think you uniquely bring to to this space of leadership um, from your background and from your experience? What makes you you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this question, I I really took some time to think about. Like, what is it? What is the unique thing about me and leadership? Um. I'll try to put it into words. The phrase I came up with is a yes and leader. Mm. And I, I think about maybe growing up the sort of stereotypical model of a leader. Unconsciously, I felt like that was not me. Mm -hmm. I was not trying to get people to follow me per se, or I didn't have any big, huge vision or idea that's like, whatever, that stereotypical model of a leader and typically male, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would say the sort of leadership that has developed within me over time that was really not intentional is very relational. And, and of course, yes, I'm trained as a therapist. And I would say people who gravitate toward this occupation maybe have a more relational posture. And so um, when I say yes, and um, I, this is something I'm still figuring out. I always tell people, I don't think I'm very competitive with other people on a mm -hmm. conscious level. Mm -hmm. I like harmony. I'm a, an agreeable person by nature. And I've been told that I'm also a great leader. I'm like, these things feel like they don't come together for me. And as I try to make sense of it, I think it's because I'm a yes and leader, right? Like you 
I may have a different opinion from you, but it, but I see the value in what mm. a colleague, a friend, a family member is saying. And it's like, oh, yes, and can we do it this way? Right. So, so that's a thing that came to my mind. And um, yeah, I, so thanks. Uh, I love that so much. Um, as a coach, I am often helping leaders to replace the word but with and. Mm -hmm. right? um, if they can make no other shift, that one's really, really critical because you know, as soon as you say but, you've dismissed or discounted what the other per person's bringing in some way. And when you shift it to and, now it's building, right? It's developing. Um, I, I, I have to go here for just a second. Uh, Mikhail and I were at a gathering last week and we started the gathering learning to do some improv which is very right-brained and we worked in small groups to tell a story and everyone had to continue the story you know following the person who like said a sentence and then went and and then you know you had to continue making up this ridiculous story um through and it was a very valuable exercise for all the reasons you just described you know you have to follow the lead of the other so mm -hmm. leaders are followers and you can build and develop and take it to another place. So I, I love that. I think that's a really thoughtful answer. Um, so thank you. I yeah, love that. I need to try that sometime. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely outside of our comfort zone. Um, and I think, you know, you said like traditionally male, I would add that in a lot of the leadership icons who have been put up in public space, at least here in the U.S. over the last however many years, have been also been white. So you get like mm. this white male normative and, and that's, you know, just, that's the model that's been there. So then we look at that and we're like, oh, well, that's not me or gosh, I don't have that kind of structural leadership or mm. goodness, do I even like the word leadership? Um, what does it, what does it even mean? And so I, uh, I really appreciate the way that your yes and framing pushes back on that and yeah. makes space for relationships and harmony. Um, I'm going to impose my own word healing into that, that you mm. didn't say, but that I feel when you say that, mm. um, as you know, so much of the premise of this podcast, there's a, we have a data point at the Dupree center and the wider literature would support this. You know, we interviewed, we did a ton of focus groups and then 35 in-depth interview with a diverse group of leaders in really every way imaginable. And one of the data points that came up is that people, when things get tough, whether it's some external situation or goodness, there's some, you know, the relation, the home relationships are on fire or, Ooh, I've been living like not as an integrated person. And all of a sudden those layers have been peeled off, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. These leaders had a particular response in those moments, and that was to lean into the work um, mm -hmm. rather than exit the work. Mm -hmm. And as we've been curious about that, we're like, gosh, that work is not mm -hmm. necessarily the thing that's put up on the pedestal. It's yeah. not necessarily the norm white male normative, you know, profit is highest, you know, add in all these other things we could put mm -hmm. there. And so the whole point of this podcast is to take some of that really rich, critical work mm -hmm. and shed a little light on it. Um, yeah. So with that in mind, I, Lisa and I are wondering if you can tell us about a particular time and the, and the theme for this whole season is life in flux, right? When mm -hmm. life is in motion, it's disrupted, there's some sort of transition happening if you can tell us about a time when life was in flux for you and how that's shaped your own life and work uh, because of what's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm so appreciative of the work that the research you've both done and, and actually in listening to your intro podcast and, and reading some of this book, I didn't realize that sort of the life I've been trying to live is sharing these traits with other leaders. And so that was really affirming for me. And as I thought about this question, this may not be the typical like transition you're thinking of. So, so let me just briefly explain. So I feel like 
my life has been in flux for many years, right? With no real hmm. significant pause. And I say this from my identity as a Taiwanese American Christian full-time working mom, mm. right? And and all of those parts of my identity really are have been in flux and continue to be. So, uh, you know, you and I have talked about some of the books that I've had the chance to write with beloved co-authors and friends. And I talk a lot about my racialized and gendered identity. And so let me explain maybe the flux for me. I, I feel like, yes, growing up with largely white male leadership models, it was very hard for me to see myself in a leadership position. So, so that was one thing. And along the way, my relationship with my own understanding of who I am as, as a woman, as an Asian American woman, as a Taiwanese American Asian woman, like all those nuances, as I went through my education, I feel like it helped me to connect to who I am more. Because by default, the world around me was keeping these parts of me invisible, so to speak, right? And there wasn't a lot of permission and I would say also from a more conservative Christian context, um, there are certain roles set up for women, right? In the Taiwanese church I grew up at, which I love dearly and still really honor and respect. Um, and in that though, there were barriers to me being able to sort of step into myself. And so I guess, um, you know, let, let me give, give a concrete example that highlights the sort of tension that I feel like I'm always living with, and it's not a mm -hmm. bad tension. So most recently, um, I I am the director of our Asian American Wellbeing Collaboratory. It's a new initiative of Fuller's Asian American Center, and so excited uh, that that it's in existence and we're launching. Um, being the director, I realized, wow, you know, in the Asian American Christian national scene, a lot of my counterparts are Asian American men doing amazing, wonderful things, people I work and collaborate with and respect. And I was finding myself uh, sort of feeling a lot of, what's the word, like internal resistance, almost mm. like, am I fit for this? Right. Mm -hmm. Is this the right season of my life? Like, what is this going to require of me? And as a side note, I don't typically wrestle with this, this kind of internal stress, distress, I would say, where I feel grateful. I live most of my days with low anxiety, low stress, um, enjoy sort of the, the, the work, the personal stuff. But this sort of call to be this director is like, oh, gosh, I feel this tension. And as I kept leaning into it, like, what is this tension about for me? I realized, oh, I worry that as an Asian American woman, what will these men think? Hmm. What do other people see and think when they see and expect an Asian American woman leader? Right. Like sort of these discourses in the air that I'm having this wrestling match with and realizing mm -hmm. this is not about who I actually feel and know myself to be. It's the stuff about racialized gender and Christian context that lives and the lack of Asian American women leaders I've had in my own life to know how to emulate and model and sort of live into this fullness. So anyways, um, yeah, I'll stop there. I've been talking a lot and welcome your reflections. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, Lisa has the next official question. So I'm just going to reflect and then plug and then hand off. But um, I bet that a lot of our listeners can resonate with the tension between who I am and who others expect me to be. 
that's just very real on a bunch yeah. of levels and a bunch of contexts. I also want to say, so, um, you know, my work, you know, it, it use me as an example. I'm not, I'm not a therapist and, um, I actually am feeling more and more like a leaders in a variety of contexts. Like we actually need some therapeutic frameworks and awareness so much so that I've literally joined my mom in some of her, she's a therapist. I've joined her in some of her digital CPE, like continuing education training. Cause I'm like, I need to know what this means. So I, um, it would be really interesting for leaders across industries and seasons of life to engage the work that you've written, Jessica, mm -hmm. with that in mind. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, oh, wait, she she like said she wrote some books, Finding Your Voice as a Beginning Marriage and Family Therapist, which is a book that a lot of people use to train other therapists. It's a yeah. really big deal for a reason. And that finding your voice aspect, you know, is, is huge. And then a newer book, a really new book, um, that is coming it's, it's by the time this podcast come out, it maybe won't even be so new, but as I'm stumbling over it, cause it's very, very new Asian American identities, relationships, and post migration legacies, reflections from marriage and family therapists. So you hear, even in that, that tension mm -hmm. between who am I, who am I supposed to be? Who does my community want me to be? What does it mean to sort all that out? So I just wanted to plug your books because um, you mentioned them, but didn't say them directly. And then I'm going to mm -hmm. hand it over to Lisa for an official question. Yeah. Thanks, Michaela. I will just echo uh, Michaela's um, observations and reflections. I think many of many of the things, the tensions that you feel are very real um, for many people. And one of the things we did in the book, um, which you may have noticed, is we contrast these common postures and uncommon postures mm -hmm. um, and encourage people to do the work to make those shifts. And what you're describing is your own shift mm -hmm. from a common posture, the thing that you've been enculturated to, to be, right, as an Asian American woman subordinate to men in some ways, both in the Christian context and in your ethnic context, and saying, no, I, I'm going to step in and lead from this place. Um, I'm curious. Uh, how, what what you've done, and you can take this as far or as you want. What what that looks like in your own you know inner work to make mm -hmm. those shifts. Yeah. How how have you made those shifts and stepped increasingly into, you know, what I would describe as a humble confidence that yes, you can mm -hmm. step into this director role. You can lead, and 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 lead very effectively from who you are, not mm -hmm. because you're following some exemplar, but yeah. because God has placed you in this particular space for this particular mm. time. What does that look like for you internally? Yeah, I love this question. And this is why I really value this podcast, this idea of there's this whole inner life that is not visible. And um, to be able to speak about it feels really secret because this is such mm. profound, deep work. And so I would I think about this on, on multiple levels. I sort of think about it in an individual, relational, and then contextual way, where individually, um, I, I feel like I've had the opportunity to read a lot of wonderful authors, including some that you cited, Father Richard Rohr, mm -hmm. a lot about this inner work, right? Parker Palmer. Um, so knowing myself, like, wh who is Jessica, right? Like, Connecting to my own personality, I've been in and out of therapy for many years. At some point, I pursued having my own coach, and that was such a gift. And so I feel like um, really valuing self-growth and self-awareness. And in the field of family therapy, we have this term, self of the therapist. And, mm. and my co-authors, and I, we write about it in our book, which is, those of us in the helping field, right? Many of us go into it because we want to help. We want to support other people. And the only way we can do that work is if we are continuing to do it as well. And so, you know, the, the sort of phrase of you can only take your client as far as you're willing and have gone. And it's really true because um, in order for me to, to see and perceive what someone else could need and who they are, I have to be able to recognize that in myself. And so to be 
more detailed, the relational component. And so I did talk to my husband last night and I was like, hey, to what degree are you okay me talking about the things we work through, right? Because <laughs> the, the marital relationship sometimes is everything in terms of a foundation, a, a battlefield, a, an analogy yeah. for how we show up in life. And so, you know, if I can just say he will, he is and tries to live out his identity as a feminist man. And in that, right, all of us inherit, especially in Taiwanese culture, patriarchal lineage. And so we wrestle with that day in and day out. And so being willing to have those conversations with my husband, knowing why and when I get frustrated and saying, and um, when I may be wrong about something and we, we, we figure it out, talk it through, go to couples therapy and I'm so grateful for a partner who's willing to do that work because I can't do it in isolation. And so as we're doing this, figuring out the parenting thing, it translates to my work, my professional life. And I realize, oh, this thing that's coming up as I work with, you know, these male colleagues, like this reminds me of the stuff that Andre and I were working through. Um, this thing that my, my kids brought up and challenged in me, this is the posture I'm wanting to take because they taught me something. And so I feel like I'm constantly navigating between my personal family life and work and that it is all part of my learning and growth. And so that's a little bit of maybe the behind the scenes stuff that goes on for me day to day. Yeah, that's extraordinary. What you just described is extraordinary um, on a bunch of levels. I, this willingness and it seems like whether it's like the neuro pathways or just the grooves of repetition of being able to see yourself as a system as well, yeah. right? So see the systems that you're in, but even, okay, I, I exist in these different parts. Um, I bet that they're, even for me, when I hear that, I'm like, I want to do more of that. How, how does she do that? Um, can you, for the person who's not as skilled in mm. leveraging the learnings when, gosh, I just raised my voice with my kids and that showed me that it was touching on this thing and whoa, that's its own version of the same thing that was happening in a work context. How do we bring those more together rather than have them uh, disintegrated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, for some reason, when you're asking that question, I had this memory that came into my mind. Mm -hmm. So this is a couple years into our marriage. I think it's before we had kids. We were coming up to a birthday party, some event at someone's house. We are in the car. And here I am, a researcher and practitioner of couples therapy, gender and power issues. So that, that's what I research and study. One of the things. And my husband and I are having this conversation and I'm just like getting annoyed and frustrated because I'm like, this person here is mansplaining mm. and just didn't hear what I just said and said the same thing, right? Like, I'm like, this happens at work, whatever. And so I told him like what he was doing and mm. I could tell his response was, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like, I didn't know a bit of both defensiveness, but also just like he was not doing it on purpose, right? And so all of the research, the clinical work I've done, I can observe and see these sort of gendered and power dynamics. I'm living it out. I have the very valid frustration that comes with it. It took a few minutes to work through so that we could show up to, to mm. our friends. And we've had many of those encounters. But what I will say is a common post response is as a woman to sort of stand firm and say, yes, you were mansplaining and you need to figure that out and stop doing it. Right. It's harmful to women. Yes. And OK, the mm. and is. I see my husband 
the person I know him to be is that he was, he truly felt bad, wasn't quite sure what was happening. And it was an opportunity for him to realize his impact on a woman that he loves Mm. and to give him, him an opportunity to let that be something he could feel and own, lean into, and us work through the rupture and the repair, right? As opposed to like, this is my stance, like you need to work on this and fix it. Um, next time this ha- it, it, you know, let's not have it happen again, as opposed to we are both a work in progress, right? We're not here to prove points or to like be right, but rather I can see underneath you know, the harm, unintentional harm, and yet still very common harm, right? Uh, that he's willing to learn and engage and that it's important for me to recognize that. And the whole history of his Taiwanese American upbringing that never gave him an opportunity to learn that this could be something that happens and that men do, right? So yeah, and that totally translates into my work because when that happens, because it does frequently, right? I can hold the tension of not being quick to judge, not being quick to put, a male colleague in a box and say, oh, this is what he's doing again and break the capacity to be in meaningful relationship, but say to myself, okay, is this someone I'm gonna keep working with? How can we have a conversation where we assume goodwill and that there's an opportunity to grow together? And for me, this has been a game changer in developing meaningful working relationships with male colleagues. And so Mm. anyway, that's one example. Oh, that's extraordinary. Uh, Just a comment on that before Lisa has the next question. Um, You said earlier that the marriage relationship is, and of course, right, you're a marriage and family therapist, right? So of course, the marriage relationship is everything. It's a foundation, it's the battlefield, it's et cetera. And then you told us a story of how working out the stuff there actually shaped your capacity to show up in a pretty different way in a professional context, in a leadership context. And I, I would just add that, you know, for those of us who don't find ourselves in marriages, mm-hmm. those primary intimate relationships, there's those are the foundation. Those are the battleground. Those are, you know, those systems are everything. So that you said it earlier and then you illustrated it there, which that's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. So, so very helpful. Um, As someone who's been married for a very long time, um, 43 years, which is like older, longer than Michaela is old, right? Makes me feel ancient. Um, (laughs) You know, I can echo that and put a big, you know, 10 exclamation points next to it. You know, the marriage relationship is a primary crucible for learning and growth. And you can either treat it as a battlefield, which often happens, as you well know, from the work you do, or, and you can learn and grow from it in the process. Um, one of one of the ways that, that I've learned with my husband, who is um, a wonderful guy in, in many, many ways, but he's, a, he's an Enneagram one. I don't know if that means anything to you. He's very mm. much a perfectionist um, and doesn't take feedback particularly well, right? And so my, my learning is, you know, to say something like, you know, I don't think this is what you intended, but here's how it impacted me. Can we talk about it? And he still might get defensive for a minute, but at least it opens the space a little bit more to say, have a, have a real dialogue around it. Right. And that's, that's what I heard you saying. Um, when you, you know, talk to your husband, like, yeah, you can punch him in the nose and say, this is your issue and you got to work on it. And all that's true, but is that really going to help him step back and think and process and make a shift, which is, you know, what, what we're after here. Um, we, we talk in the book and Mikhail, we've sort of introduced this now through the, how the conversation has gone. Um, we talk in the book about, you know, needing the right people around us, particularly in these seasons mm-hmm. of flux. And, uh, there, there are two pieces to that. I think one is what we call the trusted crew. Who are those three or four mm-hmm. in your intimate circle? Um, And then also this notion that I have embraced wholeheartedly for a long time, which is that 
every person on the planet should have a therapist, a coach, and a spiritual director. And not all at the same time, although sometimes there are moments, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but always be doing, working things out in some context with someone else. Um, I'm curious as a, as a therapist, um, how do you see that playing out? I mean, we have this loneliness epidemic. People are hungry for relationships and often seek therapy because of that. Talk about what you see around how we move increasingly into a space of deeper and richer community and what the role of you know therapy is is in all of that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Such important things to think about. You know, the first thing that comes to my mind is for for all of us to be in relationship or to seek out relationships where we can be known, oh gosh, it takes such courage, right? Like mm. I think about this, I mean, obviously as a therapist, we're inclined to see individuals and families that are, are wrestling through life. Life is not coming easy in a particular season or at all. And so the family systems I'm exposed to, typically there's less relational connection, right? Yeah. And so people, and I think this is not uncommon. It, it was, my parents are amazing. And in their post-immigration life, trying to make ends meet and make a life and, and not trained in emotional connection, right? right? And so with that being, I think, the standard of most families, children growing up are not familiar with sharing their inner life with another, right? Like having language, right? These days you got all kinds of psychologists and therapists giving us language, equipping us and children, parents to kids like, oh, sweetheart, let's reflect what you're feeling, right? I don't know. Most people didn't grow up like this. Hmm. And I think as a result, as we grow older, young adulthood, there's a real longing for being able to connect at this deep deeper level, mm. yet we're ill-equipped. We don't know or have those resources. So what I want to say is the longing to and the, the attempts to move toward it takes so much courage. And so when I work with people and I see that, to me, it's like the most beautiful and mm. scary thing. And mm. so, so for people listening, I just want to say, that that tension of like I really want this and it's so hard and it's freaking scary like it's yes to all those things mm. and to keep moving in that direction and so mm. I will say human connection in the way that most of us long for to to, to know another and to be fully known I think is a rare human experience mm. yeah. and and so the the hope of that Whatever that means in our lives, the challenges, the, the bravery it requires, leaning into it is always worthwhile. And so the hard part is, right, along the way, there's a lot of injuries, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you're attempting to do that with someone who does eventually, you know, harm you or um, it, was, it didn't end up well, right? And so we shrink back. We're afraid mm. to do it again. And so this is why a trusted therapist, a coach, right, a, a spiritual leader, a healthy spiritual leader can be partners along the way. Um, at, but the hard part is learning, having the tools to discern who can I learn to trust, right? I think that's really step one. And so all of it to say, like, I'm, I'm so grateful for the friends and the mentors and the therapists I've had along the way that by God's grace, frankly, I've had harmful experiences, but by and large, these people in my life have truly been trustworthy. And to me, that, that is a gift of a lifetime to have had their scaffolding and encouragement and partnership. So yeah, I don't know if I answered mm. some of those questions, Lisa, but yeah. that was what came to mind is just like, when we have this conversation, it's not just, a, oh yeah, do this, 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 and like, you can have right. this meaningful. No, I feel like this is the work of life, right? Mm. Our whole mm. lives is the longing, even in your 
lifetime partnership. That is a hard place to know your spouse and to be known by them is so scary, right? No matter Mm -hmm. how many years you've been married. So yeah, those are my initial thoughts. Yeah. I I want to ask one quick follow-up question, Mikhail, and then, then you can finish this up. Um, Mikhail and I did a podcast uh, where we were the guests yesterday. And one of the questions that came up that I'm super curious about your answer to, I felt like we gave okay answers, but I'm, I think you're going to have a better answer is um, how do you very practically go about building trust? Mm. Oh gosh. Yeah. That's such a good question. I love it. I'm thinking a lot about the things I talk to clients about and also the things I'm aware of in myself. Mm -hmm. My sister and I were just talking about this. My sister, who's running for a local um, government position, we were talking about how we generally like people. I don't know if it's a family thing, how our parents raised us, but we generally like people. We get along with most people. And we also don't go into deep relationship quickly, right? Like Mm. it takes time for me to feel like I have enough data, relational encounters to feel like I can go to this next level in my relationship with another person. And I really think it has a lot, it's synonymous with my relationship with myself. Mm. When I think about, you know, one of our greatest commandments or Jesus's invitation to love your neighbor as yourself. Like, I think it's a journey to love yourself yes. and know yourself, right? And so, I, for example, right, I, I know this sort of one of the things that drives me crazy about like church settings or Christian settings sometimes is like the quick invitation to be vulnerable, right? Mm. And most people, you know, young people especially, but adults as well, don't necessarily know how to gauge what is appropriate to offer another person about who I am, right? Mm. So maybe it's over disclosure and then it's misused or misunderstood. And then there's pain, relational pain as, as a result. But I think uh, trust of another has everything to do with knowing how to trust myself. Yeah. Like, mm. what am I feeling? What do I know? What do I sense in my gut about this situation, this person? And is how I'm showing up with them congruent with what my body's telling me, what I know about myself. So so that's what I think of is that the trust is both self-trust and that develops as we're trusting another person. Yeah. It's really powerful. Um, I Everything from, this is the work of a lifetime yeah. to meaningful deep relationships matter and we can't necessarily rush into those you use the word scaffolding earlier um it the those relationships where we work out how we're going to be with the rest of the world those take time they take experiences they take these choices and what i hear you saying that's very powerful is that they take a knowing ourselves mm-hmm. and a trusting ourselves and that that takes time. And it's a, sure. you know, it's a systemic back and forth piece. Um, one last question for you with all of that in mind, if you were going to go back in time, I don't know, let's pick 15, 20 years ago and say something to younger Jessica, um, about doing this work, this hidden work about the kind of leader she is, Mm. what would you say to younger Jessica? Yeah. Yeah. I love the opportunity to have conversations with my younger self. Mm. As a side note, it was funny to think about this and prepare for this podcast because In fifth grade and eighth grade, I was student council president. And it's a weird thing to think back to, right? Because I'm trying to remember myself at that age and what I thought it meant to be a leader. And I remember this, it's weird to have an embodied experience then of 
what I thought of leadership was like, oh, it's out there for me to attain. Like I need to grow outward and, and show up hmm. sort of like what we talked about earlier, that the answers are outside of myself, so to speak. Hmm. Right? What I would tell myself now is that it lives within you, within me. Like mm. not not in a sense that um, it's there and I have to go find it sort of way, but rather that there's something, and I believe this about every human being, that there's something inherently within us because we are God's beloved and in relationship with people in our lives, the hard work of excavating, unearthing, discovery. Uh, there is no clear pathway for this kind of work in life. Mm. I, I think all of us, yourselves included me, we're trying to create some sort of roadmap, scaffolding, so to speak, for, for the, the communities we love. And when you're actually doing it, there is no, it, it feels overwhelming at times mm. and dark and lonely because it's not what's modeled and patterned for us. But I think I would tell myself, like, keep listening to the voice, God's voice, your own voice. Talk with people to help clarify that for yourself and, and keep at it. Keep leaning into the, the various levels of resistance that come up mm. and that um, I think it's easy to, when you feel, um, oh my gosh, that feels hard or that did it, uh, discomfort, our human inclination is to move away from it. But I think this sort of inner work, there's so much discomfort and to, to learn how to be okay with that feeling and trust that as I push through it, with other people. And I really think, and you both talk about this in your book, not to go it alone, right? That on the other side of that discomfort, we hit these little and big milestones of just like, and I call it freedom. Hmm. Like to, um, our daughter's name is Liberty. And I think about, you know, the scripture, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And I think this is one of the ways that we get to experience this true inner and relational liberation, which is the self-knowing that shows up in community that is fully embodied in my racial gender identity. Um, so yeah, not that my 10-year-old self would understand any of this, <laughs> but I think the encouragement to, to, to trust this inner knowing. Yeah. Yeah. That's Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Jessica Chen Feng, you, we appreciate your work, your wisdom, uh, the stories you tell, and just you, who God's made you to be. So thank you so much for joining us today. What a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity, Michaela and Lisa. If you enjoyed this episode and want to keep pressing into your own inner work, head to our website to download our free resource, Challenges, Crises, and Crucibles. Thank you for tuning in to The Hidden Work of Leadership. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and found it insightful. The Hidden Work of Leadership is brought to you by the Max Dupree Center for Leadership at Fuller Seminary, where we envision a world in which leaders across industries and seasons of life are deeply formed as the people of God so that they might seek the very best for the people and systems entrusted to their care. Our episodes are produced by Justin Heap, who ensures our engineering and editing is engaging and sounds just right. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us reach more listeners like you. You can also follow the Dupree Center on LinkedIn and Instagram for updates and behind-the-scenes content. For more information about today's episode and access to additional resources, visit our website at dupree.org. That's D-E-P-R-E-E dot -E -E org. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on The Hidden Work of Leadership.